Welcome to our program, Management of AD Patients on Systemic Treatments During COVID-19. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jacob, and I will be the facilitator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. If you have questions for our presenters during today's session, please submit them by writing in the question box. Feel free to ask at any point in the presentation. We will reserve time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. Please note that due to time constraints, our panel may not respond to all questions submitted. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Emma Gutman, President of the International Eczema Council, to introduce the program and facilitators. Dr. Gutman is the Sol and Clara Kest Professor of Dermatology, Vice Chair for Research at the Department of Dermatology, and Director of both the Center for Excellence in Eczema and the Laboratory of Inflammatory Skin Diseases at the ECAN School of Medical at Mount Sinai Medical Center, New York. She has conducted extensive research in atopic dermatitis and made numerous contributions, including developing molecular maps of AD defining skin differentiation, and defined a series of biomarkers that are now accelerating testing of novel pathway-specific drugs for AD. She also was elected to the board for the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the American Academy of Dermatology. Among other honors, she received the AAD Young Investigator Award in 2011. So I'm very excited to present to you this symposium on behalf of the International Eczema Council on management of atopic dermatitis patients on systemic treatments during COVID-19. A little bit a introduction of the International Eczema Council. It was founded in late 2014. It's a non-for-profit global organization and importantly, it is led by dermatology experts on atopic dermatitis. We are governed by a 13-person board of directors and we now are happy uh, to inform you that we have over 100 counselors and associates from 24 countries. Basically, every continent besides Antarctica is represented on the IEC. So if you know somebody from Antarctica, please let us know. And we are still growing. Uh, we were responsible for multiple symposia in uh, multiple uh, large meetings, both nationally and internationally, just to name a few, World Congress of Dermatology, SID, American Academy of Dermatology, the Inflammatory Skin Disease Summit, or ISDS, the EADV, IAD, and others. And now we are also doing multiple programs virtually, such as this one, and we will do another one very shortly at the EADV. Uh, and I think we are uh, uh, responsible for uh, much of the education in atopic dermatitis on the global uh, panel. And now we will have also a, a symposium at the AAD with hand eczema and a biomarkers at the SID. So we have some very exciting future programs to look in, in for. Uh, we uh, always publish every year the most important publications that we consider as most important on our site. So please check it out at the uh, Eczema Council uh, website. And we also published multiple papers that are either consensus papers or uh, papers that are of great interest to the atopic dermatitis community on behalf of the IEC that you can also read. Some of them are listed here. The list is growing. And we have others uh, also about a, a subjects that are of great interest, such as hand eczema and biomarkers that are in the works. And of course, this would not have been possible without our partnership with our uh, colleagues in pharma that made it possible. So we want to uh, really thank them for this partnership to benefit at the and the lives of patients with atopic dermatitis. Now, I'm very excited and happy to introduce to you this symposium and our distinguished speakers for today's program. So we have Dr. Antonio Torello that comes from Madrid. He is the head of the Department of Dermatology there. 
in the Hospital Infantil Niño Jesus in Madrid since 2007. He has authored and co-authored 270 scientific articles, and he has also several books. He's a very known pediatric dermatologist, and he additionally serves as the president of the European Society for Pediatric Dermatology. We also have from Italy, Dr. Giampiero Gerolomoni, that is full professor of dermatology and head of the dermatology section in the Department of Medicine at the University of Verona School of Medicine in Verona, Italy. And he is co-editor-in-chief of clinical dermatology and has co-authored 550 peer-reviewed articles and multiple book chapters and books. And last but not least at all, we have Dr. Alan Irvine, that is a professor in, of dermatology at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, and an honorary professor in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Dundee in Dundee, Scotland. And since 2002, he has been a consultant dermatologist uh, also in St. James Hospital in Dublin. Dr. Irvine has published more than 200 peer-reviewed articles, mostly on atopic dermatitis, but also genodermatosis. And he has multiple awards, including international awards. So I'm very fortunate to be part of this very distinguished panel of speakers uh, for this uh, symposium on the management of atopic dermatitis patients on systemic treatments during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And the agenda, um, Torello, uh, Antonio Torello will start with COVID-19 in pediatric AD patients, his experience, then it will be followed by the Italian experience of Giampiero Gerolomoni. I will uh, continue with COVID-19 in New York patients and our endeavors in, in this era. And then uh, Alan Irvine will talk about the very exciting uh, registry uh, that comes from Dublin and England and will follow by a panel discussion and Q&A Q &A that we hope that all of you will participate. And now, please welcome Dr. Antonio Torello. Well, hello everyone. My name is Antonio Torello. I'm the head of the Department of Dermatology in the Children's Hospital Niño Jesus in Madrid, Spain. And my lecture today will be about COVID-19 and pediatric atopic dermatitis patients. Now, these are my conflicts of interest to declare. Well, COVID-19 in children has some peculiarities. It is not a, 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 a children's disease mostly because only one to five percent of confirmed cases are children. And overall, children have milder disease than adults, and deaths in children are exceptional. There have been some difficulties in testing for PCR children because many of them are completely asymptomatic, and these asymptomatic children are not being suspected and then not being tested. On the other hand, children with mildly, mildly symptomatic disease are negative for PCR, for reasons that we don't, we don't know, and there is also good correlation be between PCR and serology. So even patients who are negative, they will still be negative in serology, and these patients will escape the detection of uh, disease, and they will pass completely undiagnosed. This is the, um, the number of cases uh, that were seen during the, the main outbreak uh, in Madrid. And even though you see that there are many, many thousands of patients, in, especially in adult population, there were very few children admitted to a hospital, which is a reference hospital with COVID-19. Only 17 children were admitted. And of these, only 13 were admitted to intensive care unit with severe manifestations of COVID-19. And the most severe uh, manifestation in children is called pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome which is close to Kawasaki disease, and uh, it also causes with shock and severe gastrointestinal manifestations. And um, uh, fortunately, none of our patients had a, um, uh, a bad outcome. All of them survived, and they are doing very well. There were 13 cases only, and uh, this is a low number compared to the, the many patients, many adult patients who were admitted into intensive care units. 
out of the 70 cases of uh, COVID-19 uh, admitted in a children's hospital, it, it was none of our patients with uh, severe HIV dermatitis. There was uh, none of our patients had to had to be admitted because of COVID-19. Only one patient uh, had uh, um, had been untreated on treatment for cancer, but the other ones were not taking any immunosuppressant for any other disease. So it appears that most patients, if not all patients, who were admitted because of COVID-19 were previously completely healthy and were not taking any immunosuppressive drug. Of course, we know the drugs that our patients for, uh, with severe atopic dermatitis are taking may pose a risk of infection. Corticosteroids, methotrexate, cyclosporine, and acetabrine, the classic immunosuppressants, have an increased risk of, of infection uh, of through, uh, throughout the, the period of treatment. On the other hand, the pilumab does not have this increased risk of viral infection, and even there's a reduced rate of infection in patients who are being successfully treated for atopic dermatitis. So in the beginning, there was a, a concern about the potential increase in COVID-19 susceptibility in children with the classical immunosuppressants, methotrexate, cyclosporine, and acetabrine. And on the other hand, it was recognized that some of these drugs could be useful to treat patients with COVID-19 because of the inflammation and cytokine storm present in the severe cases with it, with uh, uh, COVID-19. But there was not, in the beginning, an apparent risk with the bilibab because, as you see in the table, there is not an increased risk of overall infections or upper respiratory tract infections in patients who are being treated with the bilibab for atopic dermatitis. So some recommendations have been provided by different authors. On the, on the left-hand side, side <clears throat> you see some recommendations about starting therapy and, for example, the bilobab is considered safe and uh, um, it, uh, it, it could be started during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, can be maintained in case it, it's, it's been previously uh, taken. But on the other hand, for cyclosporine and methotrexate, the risk is intermediate and should be considered in case of a starting therapy to delay this uh, therapy start and uh, in case the, um, uh, the, the treatment has been uh, already been given, to decrease uh, the, the dose or, or temporarily withdraw. And acetabrine and systemic corticosteroids are considered of the highest risk, and uh, this therapy should not be initiated unless completely unavoidable. On the right-hand side, you see that the European Task Force on Atopic Dermatitis provided some statements about uh, the uh, COVID-19 and atopic dermatitis. And uh, very early, they uh, advised to continue all immunomodulating treatments, including immunosuppressants, since exacerbations of underlying diseases could be more negative than the treatment itself. And the treatment with the bilobab is not considered to increase the risk of viral infections, and then might be preferred to conventional systemic immunosuppressants. However, there was no robust uh, clinical data supporting these statements. S different uh, different uh, papers have evaluated the risk of COVID-19 in patients with skin diseases who are on long-term immunomodulatory therapy. So the conclusions of these studies are that the outcomes of COVID-19 patients on systemic immunomodulatory agents are similar to general population. And on the other hand, this could be related to the aberrant cytokine and the inflammatory responses in severe COVID-19 that sometimes is targeted by these uh, immunosuppressive drugs. Also, the risk of COVID-19 and poor outcomes are minimally affected by dermatologic immunomodulatory medications. And many authors found no differences in age and in other factors. And uh, some of these uh, successful outcome in, in this uh, group of patients could have been 
uh, due to uh, a role in the, of successful isolation in containing the disease progression. A survey was passed uh, to many uh, um, um, experts in the, in the US and Canada regarding the use of immunosuppressive therapy for children with uh, inflammatory diseases, and uh, especially for atopic dermatitis. The conclusions of this uh, survey are presented here, and especially regarding the initiation of therapy during the pandemic, it was uh, considered to be dependent upon the context, and uh, this should be discussed with the patients and caregivers that the therapy has risks, but also has advantages, and the risk of contracting COVID-19 and leaving the disease untreated should be balanced and, and uh, discussed with, uh, with the patients and caregivers. Of course, PCR pretesting would be ideal, but this is very difficult to, to achieve in many, in many settings, and the practices are variable according to regions and institutions. For patients who were already on immunosuppressive therapy and who were um, exposed to a contact or who are confirmed to have COVID-19, in this case, the recommendations were to discontinue temporarily immunosuppressive therapy, if possible. In the case of corticosteroids, they should be tapered before, uh, um, before discontinued. Regarding JAK inhibitors, uh, it's difficult because these have not been um, so far approved for atopic dermatitis, they've been used under clinical trials, and they could impede viral clearance, but on the other hand, some of them may have a therapeutic effect in COVID-19, especially in case of cytokine uh, and uh, um, uh, release and inflammation, and so there's not a strong recommendation about them. And regarding dupilumab, the, 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 um, the experts were a little bit more relaxed regarding continuation or temporary discontinuation, but uh, they were they felt the pilumab was safer than the uh, classical immunosuppressants. Here you see the main result of this survey, and you see that um, regarding asymptomatic patients or cases who are not having any any symptom of COVID nineteen, most authorities prefer to maintain or continue therapies that were being administered. Some uh, controversy was uh, uh, existed regarding corticosteroids, but the other ones were uh, supposed to be safe in case of asymptomatic patients. But for patients who had, during therapy, an, uh, an upper respiratory infection with unknown COVID-19 status, the, the most uh, a useful recommendation was temporarily discontinue the classic drugs, but dupilumab was recommended to be maintained. And in case of exposure to COVID-19 or in case of confirmed COVID-19 infection, most authorities recommended discontinue temporarily the classic immunosuppressants. In the case of steroids, taper before suppression, before, before discontinuation withdraw all such JAK inhibitors that were being treated, and regarding dupilumab, this drug could be continued in case of only exposure, and if the case was confirmed, there was a tender to recommend uh, temporary discontinuation of the drug. Well, my personal approach during the pandemic has been quite similar to the experts. In case of initiating immunosuppressive therapies, I discussed the, the the situation with the patients and considered the risk and the benefits of starting a therapy. In the beginning, I was a little bit more scared and uh, I decided to delay the, the, the starting of therapy, but I felt reassured later and uh, I successfully started in classic immunosuppressive therapy in patients with severe atopic dermatitis without any problem. For patients who were previously on immunosuppressant therapy, my, my uh, position was to maintain the treatment if patients were asymptomatic, and if there was a contact or confirmed COVID-19, temporarily withdraw this medication. Fortunately, none of my patients who were being treated with the Bilabab had any contact, so I didn't have to make a decision. But if I had, I think I would have continued the drug because it's difficult to withdraw because the period of two weeks is, too, is long enough 
to make a decision. So um, uh, depending on, on, on the time where, uh, when the injection should be uh, administered, a decision could be variable. If the patient is known to contract COVID-19 immediately after the injection, you still have two weeks to make a decision. In my experience, my group of patients with severe atopic dermatitis under treatment did not have worse outcome than any other group of patients. And so I was reassured that uh, there was not a great impact of uh, atopic dermatitis on COVID-19 and vice versa. So in conclusion, there's a minimal influence of atopic dermatitis therapy, both on the risk of COVID-19 infection and the COVID-19 outcome, and patients and caregivers should be reassured about the atopic dermatitis therapies that are being recommended or administered. But in any case, my main recommendation is to allow for patients to gain a rapid access to caring physicians in care of any problem or in case of any doubt. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to answer questions from the, from the audience. Thank you very much, Dr. Torello. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Giampiero Girolamoni. Hello. My name is Giampiero Girolamoni. I am professor and chairman of dermatology at the University of Verona in Italy. This slide illustrates my disclosure of potential conflict of interest Atopic dermatitis is a very common inflammatory skin disease in adults, affecting between 4 to 8 percent of the population. 10 to 30 percent of cases are moderate to severe and may require systemic treatments, but frequently systemic treatments are introduced at later stage with only a portion of patients in need receiving inadequate treatment. Treatment constants in atopic dermatitis include the avoidance of trigger factors, the treatment of allergies when appropriate, especially in children, the frequent use of emollients, topical and inflammatory therapy, including corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors. Crisaborol has been approved in, New in the Europe in March 2020. Phototherapy may be effective in selected cases during the chronic phase of the disease. Systemic anti-inflammatory therapy include systemic corticosteroids, cyclosporine, and of label methotrexate, azathioprine, alitretinoin. Dupilumab is available in most European countries only in hospital-based dermatology centers. Italy was the first European country hit by the COVID-19 pandemic as early as February 2020. The graphic shows the number of COVID cases reported by each province in Italy, with the vast majority of cases condensed in Northern Italy. This, is, this slide illustrates the Italian situation as of July 16, 2020, with about 150 confirmed cases and about 35,000 deaths. The curves indicate the starting of the pandemic at the, at the end of February and its peaks in March and this progressive declining in April with few cases still positive at, at, in, in, in May. We con conceived the study on the management of patients with atopic dermatitis with is an observational study multicenter performed between February 20 until September 30, 2020, involving 35 Italian centers where any adult patients affected by moderate to severe atopic dermatitis treated with the systemic agents or phototherapy, having face to face evaluation or remote visit performed between February 20 and April 30 were, was eligible for the study. The graph shows the time of the inclusion time, in the, the inclusion time in the study and the lockdown time 
which started at the beginning of March and ended at the beginning of May. A total of 1,750 patients have been included in the study, and of this, 10.7%, 180 80 patients discontinued the treatment during uh, the time frame included. Of these patients, most were treated with dupilumab only, 71%. 21% were using dupilumab together with other drugs, including antihistamines, systemic corticosteroids, phototherapy, or methotrexate. Few patients were treated with cyclosporine alone or cyclosporine together with other drugs. Among the patients who stopped the therapy, many patients stopped the treatment autonomously, especially the patients treated with dupilumab or the patient treated with dupilumab. But in, in, uh, in patients treated with cyclosporine, either alone or in polytherapy, were stopped by the general practitioner or by the dermatologist. The reason for stopping therapy were mostly the difficulties in drug supply, and this was true for both cyclosporine and dupilumab, or the fear of the virus. Very few patients stopped the treatment because concomitant virus infection or the contact with other with, uh, with patients with uh, virus infection. Confronting the patients who discontinued the treatment compared to the patient continuing the treatment, patients discontinuing the treatment were more likely to have the infection. Indeed, very few patients, six patients because they had a, a nose and throat swab, because of hospitalization, or because of the quarantine. Many patients during the interview said that they were worsening of their skin condition during the COVID-19 quarantine. And this was possibly related to the repeated washing and sanitizing of the hands because of the increased leach according to the patient, in relation to the adverse psychological effects induced by the, the quarantine, because the lockdown have led to a diet richer in saturated fats and refined carbohydrates with the concomitant reduction in physical activity, which may have incre may had increased the pathogenic TS2 phenotype because of the less exposure to sunlight associated with, with the quarantine. But what the international organizations say about the systemic treatment during the COVID pandemic? The international eczema councils indicate that patients with COVID-19, patients without COVID-19 infection or in those who have the infection but are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, systemic treatments should not be interrupted. In contrast, in patients with active COVID infection, especially in twos with symptomatic, who are symptomatic or, and require intervention and or are hospitalized, the, the discontinuation, the temporary discontinuation of the systemic treatment may, or a dose reduction may be, may be, may be, in, may be prudent to, and as determined by the treating physician. The European Task Force on Atopic Dermatitis published a paper where they say that in patients who are not infected to continue all immune modulating treatments and the, and the frequent use of moisturizers, especially to counteract the deleterious effect of the hygienic procedures. In patients who are infected by the virus, they are symptomatic, an interdisciplinary risk assessment may be warranted. Immune modulating therapy may or not may be posed according to the specific characteristic of the patients, considering that the abrupt termination of a stable systemic treatment regimen may lead to exacerbation of atopic dermatitis or other comorbidities like bronchial asthma. And they also say that blockers of type 2 inflammation may not increase the risk for viral infection 
and may thus be preferred to conventional systemic immunosuppressive treatments. International experts say that systemic corticosteroids should be avoided to reduce the COVID infection susceptibility. Methotrexate and desatiaprine should be tapered to the lowest dose possible to avoid disease flare. And office-based phototherapy may be altered to, re to maintain the social distancing. What about cyclosporine? Interestingly enough, cyclosporine in vitro has been shown to reduce the replication of other coronavirus like MERS and SARS coronavirus. In, pra in practice, it is prudent to, shoot, to taper to the lowest possible dose to avoid disease flare. And indeed, cyclosporine may be favored over treatment with systemic corticosteroids. What about dupilumab and COVID-19 infection? Dupilumab has a very safe, favorable safety data and most of the experts indicated it may be safely initiated and continued in uninfected patients. But there are several reports from North America and from Europe indicating that dupilumab can be, can be safely continued in uninfected and even in infected patients. Indeed, of patients in, under dupilumab, very few patients have been reported to, to, uh, to acquire the infection. In Italy, there are uh, at least three studies indicating that adult patients under treatment with dupilumab, only a tiny fraction developed COVID-19 infection. And of these few patients, they could have a regular course of the disease without additional complication. In conclusion, what to say as concluding remarks for topic dermatitis and COVID-19 pandemic. First, anticipate the next wave. Reassure patients, but do not become complacent. Keep masking and social distancing. ID requires long-term treatment in most cases. Stopping abruptly the treatment may be associated with disease worsening. In general, systemic corticosteroids are better avoided and caution should be taken with traditional immunosuppressants. Lupilumab is not broadly immunosuppressive and can be initiated and continued safely. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Girolamoni. And now I'm happy to welcome Dr. Emma Gutman. I'm very excited to present to you our uh, attempt to characterize the response to COVID-19 in subjects with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And our New York experience with COVID-19, as you know, New York um, uh, had a, a very high rate of COVID-19 uh, infections and hospitalizations. We are doing much, much better now, but uh, we, we uh, were exposed to multiple uh, patients with COVID-19, including those with inflammatory skin diseases, which gave us the opportunity to be uh, doing the study. And I have to also acknowledge two very talented people from my department, Dr. Alexandra Golant, our Associate Program Director, and Dr. Benjamin Anger, that without them, this study would not have happened. So while there are so many publications on COVID-19, such as a, this very important publication in The Lancet from February 2020 that discuss the clinical features of patients infected with a, the novel virus and in the cytokine storm a, that the virus a, causes, there are still many unknowns about a, a subjects of great interest to us, patients with inflammatory skin diseases and particularly atopic dermatitis patients that are candidates for systemic medications and how are we treating them in this era. Now, there are possible uh, uses of immune modulators that were postulated uh, during this COVID-19 era, and it goes both ways. Some of these immune modulators were actually postulated to potentially help the cytokine storm 
that COVID-19 induces, such as uh, some pilot studies on baricitinib and ruxolitinib, so pilot studies on JAK inhibitors that potentially could be used in, to in, in attenuate the cytokine storm, or other, the, uh, other um, uh, treatments such as IL-6 uh, antagonism, uh, with tocilizumab or sarilumab and uh, others. On the other hand, there are uh, some uh, case reports uh, and review articles that uh, talk about considerations for safety in the use of systemic medications for inflammatory skin diseases, such as psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, with various biologics, such as dupilumab for AD, IL-17 and IL-23 for psoriasis, and uh, beyond uh, with uh, other systemic medications. And this is very important for us because uh, COVID-19 is here to stay for a while, and we need to understand what are we doing in this era to treat our patients. So just a short background on uh, patients with atopic dermatitis and what considerations we need to have in this time. So patients with atopic dermatitis are at a higher risk, as we know, for certain infections, skin infections, such as staph aureus and herpes. And of course, attenuated viral vaccines are contraindicated in these patients. And it is crucial to understand how moderate to severe atopic dermatitis patients on systemic immune modulating agents with and without associated comorbidities such as asthma will respond to COVID-19 in case they are infected. And also it's important to realize that certain populations are a potentially disproportionately affected by COVID-19 from some preliminary publications such as African-Americans as we learned also from our experience in New York. And these African Americans also have higher incidence of atopic dermatitis. There are several publications about that and also potentially have more severe atopic dermatitis. It is particularly important to understand clinical and immune responses in this specific population. Thus, it is important to understand the atopic dermatitis specific COVID-19 responses in patients on systemic medications to really be able to guide the way we treat our patients with atopic dermatitis in this period and maybe beyond. Now, in the very important publication in The Lancet that I already alluded to showed that among severely ill patients that were admitted to ICU with COVID-19, many cytokines were elevated as compared to controls. And this included very high levels of the TH2 cytokines such as IL-4, IL-10 and IL-13. And thus far, no efforts have been published evaluating the role of TH2 inflammation in the severity of symptoms and outcomes in a patient with COVID-19. Furthermore, there was no large study uh, published evaluating the incidence and severity of COVID-19 among patients receiving TH2 blockade for AD. And also, as African Americans seem to show more serious complications and perhaps a higher death rate due to COVID-19, we also aim to understand whether systemic medications and biologics have differential impact on COVID-19 responses. Now, of note, and this is important to realize, some preliminary studies show now that asthma may confer some protection against a, a COVID-19 or SARS a, a infection. So the hypothesis to the study that I will show you is that TH2 blockade or modulation preferentially promotes a TH1 skewed antiviral immune response, leading to decreased or asymptomatic clinical severity with COVID-19. COVID-19 infection. So, as I told you, patients with AD are at increased risk for infections. And in dupilumab that we all uh, know from the treatment with the of atopic dermatitis patients is approved for inadequately controlled moderate to severe AD and also for asthma and nasal polyps. It blocks the shared receptor for IL-4 and IL-13 and dupilumab inhibits the TH2 axis, but we showed that it does not cause a reduction in TH1 axis, which may be required to mount antiviral immune responses. And importantly, 
There are several studies published, but this one is a, the largest one a, published by a Larry Eichenfield that looked at infections in the Philomap clinical trials in atopic dermatitis. This is a pooled analysis of multiple uh, studies. And this showed that dupirumab did not increase overall infections and actually trended for lower rates of cutaneous infections. Now, uh, we also need to remember JAK inhibitors that are coming up now in uh, phase three. And uh, we need to remember that some uh, earlier publications, particularly in other indications, not in atopic dermatitis, showed that broad JAK inhibition, such as tofacitinib, that blocks JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, have been associated with increased herpes zoster rates. But thus far, specific JAK inhibition with the newer agents, such as JAK1 inhibitors, show good safety profile, including a, a lack of infections in atopic dermatitis patients. But of course, we need more data. But thus far, it looks good in terms of infection. And we need to also remember that different JAK inhibitors are tackling different a, a cytokines, a primarily TH2 cytokines for JAK1, a, and different a, JAKs and a, different cytokines. Now, the aims of our study uh, were to evaluate the incidence and severity of COVID-19 among moderate to severe atopic dermatitis patients treated with various agents, dupilumab, as compared to patients treated with broad oral immune suppressants or with topical treatments, but these are patients that are candidates for systemics and to evaluate whether African-American patients with moderate to severe AD that are treated with specific anti-TH2 treatments such as dupilumab have milder symptoms in the setting of COVID-19 compared to those with similar severity that are treated with other immunosuppressants and whether there are differences between patients with various ethnicities that are treated with dupilumab in mounting viral responses and to evaluate and characterize immune axis polarization in blood of 125 AD patients with reported symptoms of COVID-19 on dupilumab and respective associations with clinical severity as compared to 125 patients with reported symptoms on broad immune suppressants, particularly as it pertains to Th1 versus Th2 cytokine involvement, but other immune pathways will also be evaluated. So what did we do for that? We pulled all the department practically and we set up a Mount Sinai-based registry that is set to enroll 1,200 at least of our moderate to severe AD patients treated with dupilma. We have, believe it or not, in Mount Sinai, more than 1,200 patients treated with dupilma, as well as at least 1,200 patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis that are treated with broad immune modulators, such as cyclosporin, methotrexate, phototherapy, or with topical treatments, but still are candidates for systemics. We are calling all patients. We obtained IRB approval. We are calling all the patients to collect all the information, including AD treatments, duration of treatments, COVID testing status, symptoms, duration, exposures, and treatment, and medical history and medications, demographics, and also a history of asthma and comorbidities. And also we are obtaining a serum for viral serology and biomarkers and also nasal swabs. A, the part two of this study will be laboratory evaluations, cytokine profiling in blood using Olink, including ACE2, and nasal swabs for ACE2. So where are we today? We are actively collecting information from patients by phone. We already collected about a thousand atopic dermatitis patients. I'm not talking about it today, but we are also collecting psoriasis patients, and we have around seven or 800 patients with psoriasis collected today, and about 100 tissue samples that are already collected, either blood or in, in nasal swabs. And again, this is an ongoing project and that I think will be very valuable for the field. So what's next? Laboratory evaluation, and we are continuing patient collection. And I just want to show you one very preliminary graph a from, and this is very preliminary from what we have, but you see on the left side, atopic dermatitis patients treated with dupixent. The middle is atopic dermatitis patients on systemics. And then we have atopic dermatitis patients treated with topicals. 
And this is the group of exposure in group, meaning these are patients that were exposed to validated patients with COVID or that they reported for sure that they had a COVID. And we see that in these patients that had validated exposure or validated COVID, most of the patients with the pilumab, or there is a significance between symptomatic versus asymptomatic. So the pilumab treated patients treated, tended to be less symptomatic than patients on systemics that are broad systemics or that are treated with topical medications. And as you see, we have a p-value thus far, but again, we are very early in the game and we will have many, many more patients to ascertain that. And of course, we will be backed also by a relative serology at some point. Um, so the preliminary results among atopic dermatitis patients who are known to have COVID-19 exposure or have reported the high risk exposure to someone with known or suspected COVID-19. Patients with dupilumab uh, treated with dupilumab have lower frequency of symptoms than patients receiving broad systemic therapies and compared with those on topical treatment or not, no treatment. And patients on dupilumab have more mild symptoms than patients receiving other systemic therapies and, and those on uh, topical therapies or no treatment. A future analysis, molecular studies, as I uh, told you, um, but this will happen much later. Uh, and also a nasal swabs, so blood and nasal swabs and will compare with a uh, symptom severity. Now, uh, from my own practice, how do I translate this to my own practice in New York? So based on this data and also preliminary published data, I am not encouraging uh, patients right now to stop systemic treatments uh, if symptomatic. Of course, the effect of drugs on protective immune responses must still be determined because we do not know the long-term effects. Uh, and based on emerging data, I think it is important to tell patients not to stop or to adjust their dosing on their current systemic treatment. And there is no data that systemic treatments are actually worsening COVID-19 responses. But of course, I will prioritize more narrow targeting treatments such as dupilumab and specific treatments targeting specific cytokines or more targeted JAK inhibitors over broad immune suppressants such as oral prednisone, cyclosporin, or methotrexate. And we will definitely adjust our thinking as we go back by new evidence. So with that, I thank you so much for your attention and I'll be happy later on to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gutman. Please welcome our final speaker today, Dr. Alan Irvine. Thanks for joining this part of the symposium where I'm going to discuss the Secure AD registry initiative, which includes a patient facing registry and a physician facing registry. So before I start my formal presentation, I'm going to introduce uh, Tim Burton, who's a patient representative in the, in the registries project, and Connor Broderick, who is a PhD candidate, who's uh, also a dermatologist, uh, who is helping to run um, all of the registries, but has a particular interest in the patient registry. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Connor Broderick. I'm an eczema researcher at King's College London. And I'm speaking to Tim Burton, a patient with eczema, who's been involved with eczema research for over eight years. Together, we're working on two international projects to look at the effects of COVID-19 on patients with atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema. The Secure AD Physicians Registry and the Secure AD Patient Survey. Thanks for the introduction, Connor. A little bit more about me. I live and work in Nottingham in the UK, and I've had bad eczema for over 30 years. I have definitely struggled with it at times and have used many different treatments over the years. We urge anyone who has had COVID-19 at any time to provide details of their experience using our survey. Anyone who is currently unwell with COVID-19 should wait at least two weeks from the start of their symptoms before completing the survey. In addition to the patient survey, we've also set up a secure AD Physicians Registry which allows doctors and nurses looking after patients with eczema to register any current cases of COVID-19 or any past cases of COVID-19 in their eczema patients. The Physician's Registry complements the patient survey and it will allow us to compare what happens 
to patients with eczema, to patients with other skin diseases such as psoriasis or alopecia through similar registries, so protect or secure alopecia. We'll also be able to compare what happens to patients with skin diseases to patients with other diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis. Tim, do you have anything final to say about the Secure ID patient survey? Thanks, Connor. The patient survey is completely anonymous and can be completed online in about 10 minutes. It asks simple questions about your eczema, your eczema treatment, and what happened during your COVID-19 illness. You can ask someone to help you complete the survey, or you can complete it for a child with eczema, or for anyone who doesn't have easy access to a computer or a smartphone. Please follow the links from the website www.secure-derm.com There's a lot more information available on the website. Please have a look. That's great, Tim. Thanks for your time today. So thank you to Tim and Connor for that um, introductory video, which is also on the website uh, for, uh, to inform people about the project. I'm going to talk in, uh, in a little bit more detail about what the uh, Secure AD Registry projects are doing and what we've achieved and what we hope to achieve uh, in the next uh, six months or so. So just uh, a little bit about me. I'm an IEC uh, director um, since the initiation of the organization. I'm a co-project leader in the Secure AD Registries. My interests are in pathophysiologic mechanisms in AD and severity in uh, treatment of severe AD. I'm joined in this project as, uh, uh, these are my disclosures. I'm joined in this project by Carson Floor, who will be well known to many uh, viewers. He's, his interests are, uh, are similar to mine in this domain. He's interested in methods of disease prevention and therapeutics of severe disease. And Philip Spools is the other co-PI based in Amsterdam. Uh, with an interest in evidence-based dermatology and a focus on severe atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. This is the Secure AD landing platform, and this is a hosting uh, platform which includes physician registries and a patient survey. The physician registries include a separate registry for alopecia areata, which we're not going uh, to discuss today. The registry is created in WordPress, so you can get um, a translation into virtually any commonly spoken language you require by selecting the top right hand corner. And what this says is really we want physicians and patients who have atopic dermatitis to report their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Secure AD uh, registries are part of a secure network. It, we originally took our design from the Secure IBD database and we did this deliberately so that we could have comparable uh, data across various immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. <clears throat> These include, include IBD, uh, alopecia areata, and also the PSO Protect. We have very close uh, uh, align, alignment with that. So we can look at outcomes in psoriasis, eczema, inflammatory bowel disease, and alopecia. So see which things are drug dependent, which are patient dependent, and which are disease dependent. We have a steering committee, um, which includes the three PIs who you mentioned, um, and uh, various people who work in our groups, uh, Angela, Connor, Ching Ching, who's based in Taiwan, Aaron Duker, who, who from uh, Toronto, Kenji Kabashima from Kyoto, Andy Musters in from Amsterdam, uh, David, our statistician in London, and Dimitri, our health informatician. We have two uh, patient uh, representatives, Bernd and Tim. We have an international advisory committee, which includes two members from the IEC, namely Amy Paller and Emma Gutman. And we have representatives from uh, the AAD, from the EADV, and all of the major dermatology associations. We have multiple partners, um, national and international societies, that are interested in the study of atopic dermatitis and uh, epidemiology. We also have a strong patient representative uh, group, and this has only really gotten started about three, three weeks ago. And these four are patient uh, support groups from many uh, nationalities, and they've become very energized recently about the patient portal. 
There are two types of data that there are um, that are collected. The registered invest investigator data are subject to the uh, general data protection regulations, which are part of the European law, um, and we we record uh, with people's consent their name and their and their email and their centre address, <clears throat> and it's all been properly regulated through the Irish Data Protection Authority. We also uh, secure anonymized data, so physicians on the physician portal or patients on their own portal will submit anonymized data, uh, which, is, uh, which can't be traced to any individual. There's no individual identifiers. The data are all hosted in, in Germany on a secure server. So this is a landing page for the secure ID registry. Uh, each individual reporting physician or nurse uh, will create their own identity and then have a, a secure password where they can upload data. This is what the uh, the interface looks like. You know, we, we, there's a drop down menus for drugs, when the COVID was diagnosed, how it was diagnosed, and there's quite a lot of granular detail on the patient's journey through the, their COVID disease. We record uh, which systemic therapy they were on. Uh, we record what therapies were offered, if any, for COVID, and we record outcomes, uh, including death and full recovery, obviously, from uh, for COVID. Uh, these these are some of the alopecia uh, uh, fields, which are which are very similar. We have a, a social media presence with um, Twitter for Secure ID um, to promote the the registry and patients and physicians. These are, um, we've seen Jean Piero's data, which are all, Jean Piero's data are, are, uh, will be included in the registry because his group is a, is a partner in this. But so I've extracted or eliminated Jean Piero's data because we don't want to see that twice. But this is just a snapshot from a week or so ago at looking at the areas where uh, the countries where data had been registered from. A lot from Italy, where obviously there was a huge wave of COVID, but also increasingly now in the United Kingdom. If we look at therapies that people were on, Gipilimab is a dominant therapy in, in our group with others on methotrexate. We do have patients who are in clinical trials, for example, tralokinumab and abrocitinib data. The Secure AD patient survey looks a little bit like this. Um, there's lots of information. Um, remember, this is an anonymized survey, so people can report on their own behalf or uh, on somebody else, for somebody else who doesn't have access to the internet or for their child. It's all anonymized, so it's safe and secure to do so. The patient registry has only been going three weeks, and these are the details. A lot of pickup in the United Kingdom and the United States, it's only really just beginning to be promoted elsewhere in Europe and in the Far East. So we're, it's very early days in the patient registry. We have some very high level data, for example, uh, what happened um, during the COVID-19, what happened to their eczema, did it get better or worse? Um, most, it's fairly 50-50 in this small sample size, but we're hoping that this will expand quite rapidly. The PSO Protect registry, which is a sister registry really, has in the order of 1,700 patients in it, but they've been going about uh, six weeks longer than us. So hopefully we can we can catch up quite rapidly. So just to summarise, uh, the Secure ID registries offer a collaborative platform for entering both physician level and patient level data. All physicians responding will be contributors and authors and any publications responding from the project coming from the project. Please contribute your cases. The more people contribute in a collegial way, the more data we will get and the more we'd be better able to inform all of our patients as we go through what looks like a series of waves of this um, pandemic. So thank you for your attention today. Um, it's much appreciated. We're going to take questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Irvine. At this time, our speakers will reconvene for questions and panel discussion, led by Dr. Irvine. I'll just wait for a moment for everyone to get their cameras back on. Uh, we've had a couple of questions. Um, uh, Aaron Drucker has asked, uh, what is the impact of COVID-19 and atopic dermatitis clinical trials, will there be significant disruption and delay to the pipeline for new therapies and 
Jean Pierre, would you want to start that? Do you want to respond yeah. to that? Yeah, I already answered to Aaron. Uh, we are involved in two trials at the moment, in uh, one topic or one systemic, but the, we are following the patient by teledermatology, by teleweb. So there was not actually a big impact in the, in the execution of the trial. I mean, so didn't we didn't feel we didn't add a, 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 an interruption in our procedure of, of the trial. Do you think, Jean Pierre, there's going to be any delay in bringing new sites to open new studies? You know, the, the studies that are running, I think there's a obviously yeah. a, a, there's a kind of a, a patient safety and a duty of care to maintain. Yeah, it is be very much country dependent, you know, and, and location dependent. Uh, COVID infection now is is a very is a spot disease in many countries in Europe at least. So it depends on the local situation, I think. Emma, do you see any any um, slowdown in opening new trials? Existing trials have to be continued to some degree, but the uh, opening new trials and new pipelines, do you think there will be a delay or a significant delay? I think there will be some delay, but I can tell you at our site, because we couldn't enroll for so long, we have about 50 patients waiting for trials. So I think eventually it will catch up because, you know, people still have severe eczema and not everybody is controlled by dupilumab. So I think it will catch up. But yeah, I think few months delay. Yeah, I think one of the things, uh, Aaron, is a lot of the regulatory work was done remotely. So it was still possible uh, once the initial kind of um, bulge around COVID related uh, in IRB and ethics, um, once that got through and the IRB committee started working again remotely, then there are several trials that are, that are getting through to approval and ready to open. And I guess, as Emma says, there is a degree of pent up or backed up demand to enter these. So they probably will recruit quite quickly again. I think the other area where I've seen some changes being made is, as Jean Piero says, you know, there may be, there's a question is like, do we need to see our patients as frequently as we do in the trials? And I think um, everyone's going to be asking that, you know, what, how often do you need to see people face to face? And can you take out some, some visits? Um, because obviously they, they may come under threat. So I think there may be some slightly different trial designs come out of it um, and slightly reduced face to face visits. I think we see that for all areas of, of drug development. So anybody want to say anything else on that question? The, um, and I'm just looking to see what questions are coming in from the audience. You, you can all um, type in questions if you, as you, as you wish. Um, the, we, we have a question here just from Emma about ACE2 receptors from Robert McDonald, which you've already answer, but just do you want to expand a little on that, Emma, just about the um, ACE2 receptors and the role in COVID and the potential role in modifying the response to type 2 um, immune modulation? Yeah, so um, we need to really understand, um, uh, it's really not clear yet uh, what the role is and uh, whether the ACE2 is in, in, in uh, what, what are the levels actually in both blood, uh, skin, in, in nasal swabs, and uh, how they affect the uh, COVID-19 responses? I think uh, there is a lot still to learn. Um, we actually have a paper now that is um, in press in allergy um, together with Amy's group in which we compared children and adults, um, and we also compared male and female. Uh, that explains maybe a little bit uh, differences in ages, but I think we are still at the very beginning uh, of understanding it. And um, uh, certainly, and that was a very good question. I think also we need to understand the ethnic uh, differences. And um, I think uh, in New York, we have this plus that we really have a very um, varied population in which we have multiple ethnicities. So um, our own uh, study that um, is a um, he also partially NIH funded a, will a, look at a, ACE2 a, both in blood and will look at it in a, nasal swabs as well. So we will be able to determine and compare it with the severity of the patients, both the AD severity and the symptoms severity. 
So the question for uh, Gio and for Emma, the, well, has, the, has the COVID experience in the last five months, is it impacting now your, your choices with the patients who do get to see you in, in real life or remotely who clearly need systemic treatment of whatever type for their, for their atopic dermatitis? Is it, are you making any different choices as a result of COVID about what therapies you initiate for people who clearly need them? So uh, the answer is I, I make a little bit uh, uh, different uh, choices. So if before I would uh, sometimes uh, start cyclosporin uh, for some time uh, before starting uh, dufilumab um, or before transitioning a patient to a clinical trial uh, in that a short period of time. Now I'm much more minded uh, and I would um, refrain from cyclosporine. I never give oral prednisone, so that's not an issue in my own clinic, but um, I would be much more easy to give um, a dupilumab or to go for a more targeted treatment when I'm uh, thinking of a clinical trial. So a little bit, it, it does impact my treatment, but uh, generally speaking, I'm not uh, suggesting to uh, stop uh, any treatment, uh, stop it gradually and move a patient to a treatment that uh, there is perhaps more evidence uh, uh, that it's more compatible with this time. Jude? Yeah. The, the same is for me. I mean, I, I exactly the same. Uh, using cyclospore nowadays is more complicated, especially for the relationship with the general practitioner, because the general practitioner, which in my country is responsible for transcribing the, so to have the, 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 the drug reimbursed, when I prescribe cyclosporine is, is more hesitant. So he knows that it's an immunosuppressive agent, and uh, so it's more difficult to, to use cyclosporine. So we go directly to the piloma more frequently now. Yeah, so it's a, it's a definite shift in comfort levels and I suppose yeah. the other thing is the, the frequency of visits as well and, and the, the frequency of, of lab monitoring. There's an advantage um, yeah. there. And that, again, if hospitals or even primary care facilities become more difficult at times yeah. uh, to get to, then you don't have that worry about a creatinine or a, or a neutrophil counter uh, and so on. So there's certainly a, an ease of prescribing on both sides. Um, how, how do you find your, your patients uh, are behaving? Are they, are they all coming as much as they want as they previously did? Or are you finding any clinic hesitancy in your practices, people who no longer want to come or want to minimize things? Are you asking to me? Yeah. 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 Uh, people, patients in general are more hesitant to come to the hospital because they have seen for months, for several weeks, all the hospital crowded by people with the, with the mask, the, <laughs> so they, they are hesitant to come to the hospital. Indeed, in the hospital, the COVID infection did not impact so much because, because only a fraction of the hospital was dedicated to the COVID patients. But the feeling of the patient is that the hospital is a very in infectious area. So they don't like to come to the hospital. Actually, I increased my private practice outside the hospital <laughs> because the patients are, told, are not willing to come to the hospital. But now the, the PRTs are progressively declining. I mean, we are going to the progressive normalization. Same. <laughs> for you, Emma, the same thing. People are still coming. Yeah, I have to say that in New York, we are seeing uh, patients actually returning uh, to the hospital. But in our case, the clinics are not exactly located in the hospital. They are in the outpatient clinics. And in, I think the hospital did a very good job to bring patients in really one by one. And um, we never have a lot of people in the waiting room. Uh, but um, if we see, for example, four patients an hour now, I will say that three of them will be in person and one of them will be by video, which is very different than in the beginning that likely four were by video. So I think it's, it's getting much, much better. Yeah, I think we're, we're doing the same. We're, we're having um, split clinics. We certainly like to see all the new people before they're gonna be initiated in person. It's a lot easier to do that, but people who are well established on therapies, some of them are electing to have uh, teleconferencing or, or more remote uh, cl clinic visits. And that's quite appropriate for a lot of people who are, um, who are well established and who you, ha you know well. I find it difficult with, um, with new patients to really assess them properly and fully in, uh, remotely. 
are you making plans, either of you, for a second wave or a resurgence of it? Or has it been so bad in New York that there can't be a second wave? What What's the view? I, I do not know. I think, <laughs> um, you know, not entering into any political uh, comments, I, I think are actually our... Um, um, governor did a really good job uh, and even in in the beginning maybe many of us uh, thought oh he's being too cautious but I, I think it worked we, we have very low numbers it's now in uh, the infection rate I think is under a one percent and this is down from 20 percent in the beginning so I think a lot of progress and what about you Gio you see it are you planning for a second wave in any way, or do you think yeah, it's? You know, we, we we're we're waiting for a second wave in, in Spain, oh, okay. yeah. and uh, but hopefully it will not be as, as severe as it was. So we're not seeing many many children. I I only see children in my clinic, but uh, the patients are back to the regular schedules. We're having normal scheduled consultations. We're back to our treatments. I think everything has normalized a lot, even though we're wearing masks and uh, and, and, uh, and other social distancing me measurements. But uh, um, maybe this will bring back uh, a new a new wave of of, uh, of COVID nineteen. We're prepared for that, but um, it is expected that it, it will not be as, as 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 it was the first one. Maybe milder, and uh, we will be more prepared for the for the impact. Yeah, uh, I think we have learned something about telemedicine. I think it was good enough for some patients, especially for the patients who are in stable disease, in stable remission. They need just only the prescription. You can talk to the patient by, by video, it's okay. But for the new patients, or for the patient who have relapses or not doing very well, telemedicine is not good enough. So uh, I think we've I, learned. Yeah. Please. I think we've learned that, that patients and doctors do not like telemedicine. No, in general, that, it's, not, it's not good enough. Unless the patient is, going, is doing very well, is very abroad, is very far away from the hospital, then the prescription can be done at the same level. But if the patient is doing very well, it's okay. If the patient is not doing very well, it's not good enough. Communication, <laughs> nonverbal communication is not working with the telemedicine. True. Yeah. Those patients who are doing very well do not need us. Uh, exactly. <laughs> For the patient who don't need us, telemedicine is okay. <laughs> it really works. Who need the doctor is not okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and we don't seem to have any more questions in from the, the audience. But um, so I'd like to thank everyone for, for all their contributions. I'd like to thank um, Margaret and Josephine for all their background uh, help in making things run smoothly on these platforms. I think we're all learning every time we do this and I really appreciate that. We have one more question coming in here. Do we have more questions? Um, no, let's see. I think there's possibly one more question I'm trying to find uh, if I can. Oh yeah, just a thank you note. So the um, so yeah, so <laughs> so we don't need to answer. Thank you, for, thank you for thanking us. So listen, thanks to everyone for giving up their time, and thanks to the, the, the I think we got to about 130 participants or 140 at one point. So thanks to everybody for listening in and for all of your attention to everybody for their contributions and giving up their time. It's very much appreciated on behalf of the uh, the IEC. So everybody have a good afternoon or morning or evening, wherever in the world you are. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you, Emma. Bye. Antonio. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thanks so much. Bye.